Hello, everyone. Uh, starting a bit late, but we're really excited to host um, uh, Craig um, from the Google AI Quantum team. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the interest of time, we'll, I'll just hand it off to you, Craig. And uh, yeah, we're super excited. Uh, please go ahead. All right. Uh, you can hear me okay. You can see the slides. Everything good? I'll yep. take that as a yes. yes. Yep, looks good. Yeah. All right. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Craig, and I'm a software engineer slash research scientist on Google's quantum team. Uh, I think these lightning talks are ostensibly supposed to be about the company, but I wasn't really interested in giving that kind of talk because, you know, this is a hackathon. It's not about, you know, long-term visions or roadmaps. It's about doing something technical and likely to fail and, you know, cool over a weekend or small amount of time. And I feel like I have a pretty strong personal connection to that sort of project. I have a lot of ideas for projects like that, way more than I'd ever have time to actually do. So I might as well put some of them out there. Maybe someone else will find them interesting. I think it's worth their time to do. Uh, I'll mention, I do realize it's a bit ironic to give this talk at the end of the hackathon instead of at the start. Like the judging is already over, it just finished. So it's probably too late to pick a project. Uh, so I guess I'm just running off the assumption that nothing is stopping you from doing these next year or at another hackathon or just on your own. Just uh, don't think too hard about the ordering of the talk versus the other things. Um, before I get into the ideas, I wanna share why I think these hackathon type projects are valuable. Basically, these quick technical projects have the ability to teach you things, and also sometimes they turn into very serious projects. Like, there are a bunch of successful video games out there in the world, like Baba is You and Superhot, that started their life at hackathons. Like People make their livings off these kinds of things. And for me personally, uh, I do a lot of these type of weekend projects, and one of them was I wrote like a simple quantum circuit simulator like you see here. I uh, had a few gates, some visualizations of the circuit's function, a few puzzles, uh, absolutely terrible performance. There's a reason it only shows three qubits. Um, but as I kept learning things about quantum computing, I kept coming back to this and I kept making changes to it. And it's kind of a self-reinforcing process, to be honest, where uh, I would learn something and I'd explain it to the computer. And then the computer would show me the kind of consequences of this thing. And I would learn that way. So like when I learned about block spheres, I added block spheres to the simulator and then all of a sudden, I was learning all these basic facts about block spheres, like when you measure a qubit, you snap its block sphere vector to the z-axis. Anyways, I, I kept learning and tweaking and uh, improving until eventually I had something that's really good. In fact, probably some of you recognize the simulator, which I called Quirk. Uh, now, I don't carefully track who uses Quirk. I, I don't want to. But I know it gets a couple hundred visits per day. I know it gets used in some university courses and like there's this free quantum computing textbook that was just released by Tom Wong that's like 60% links to quirk circuits. So this weekend project grew into something that I think ended up being really valuable to the field uh, and also valuable to me personally since it's part of how I got on to the Google quantum team in the first place. Um, it would be a bit of an oversimplification to say it's why I got onto the team, but there was a lot of reasons, but it definitely didn't hurt. Anyways, you can see why I'd be excited or in favor of these types of projects. There's so much out there that's that's not done, that could be done, that would be interesting if someone just had the time and the interest and the motivation and the right idea. So I'm assuming some of you have time and some of you have interest and some of you have motivation, maybe all three, um, but maybe you need ideas. So I, let's go over a few ideas. Uh, by the way, you'll probably notice a common theme and all these ideas is trying to make quantum more accessible, like more intuitive. I think we're in this weird place in history where even though it's been 100 years since quantum mechanics was discovered, we still think of it as being weird instead of as being reality. And I don't think that's a permanent state of affairs. You know, it took a long time for humanity to get used to the like Newtonian conception of reality as a math machine. Uh, regardless, uh, I have a tendency to look for ideas that would push that process of finding quantum mechanics normal along. All right, first project idea. One of the problems I always have when I'm trying to explain quantum computing to someone is there's nowhere to start from. 
Our most basic building block, the qubit, is already entirely alien. People have no everyday reference for them, the way that like a light switch would be an everyday reference for a bit. But what if you could give someone an everyday object, something they could hold in their hands, and it acted like a qubit? Uh, I tried to do this once, and my version of it was these like, polystyrene balls with Arduinos inside of it to track the motion. And you'd like turn the ball to rotate the simulated qubit and smack the ball to cause measurement. Uh, but I'm not very good with microcontrollers and physical objects. So I never got this to work well. And then ended up just kind of sitting on my shelf over there. Um, but you know, there's nothing fundamental to this project that makes it impossible. I still think that someone could do this. They just have to have skills that I didn't have. Uh, and, and I also don't want you to get too hung up on the specifics of how I imagine doing this. Like there's no reason they have to be balls. Uh, like they could also just be your phone. The main thing I think is core to this idea, the, the thing that I find interesting about it is you shouldn't interact with them by pressing buttons on a screen. You should, you should interact with them by actually moving your body and passing them around as if they were real physical things. So I, I'd love to see someone make something like this and then just give them to a few kids and see what they do or use them as a useful prop in a, like a tutorial video. Project idea number two. There are so many ways that we use to draw quantum computations. People here are probably familiar with circuit diagrams, but those are just one way to do it. Uh, for example, researchers who work with optical tables have their own language for quantum processes based on the pieces of glasses and other thing that they have available that they put down on their tables. Uh, and they're much more focused on like spatial layout, whereas circuit diagrams are more focused on time ordering. For example, one of the weird things about converting an optical table into a circuit diagram is that things that show up once on the table can show up multiple times in the circuit because like the beam path bounces off things and goes through the same object multiple times. Now, there's a major problem with most of these representations. And that problem is that they're entirely analog. We make them with drawing programs like Inkscape and Photoshop and SketchUp. And those programs have no notion of the underlying computation these diagrams represent, of course. So they can't help us find mistakes or show us unexpected consequences or, or teach us things. And because they're generic drawing programs, their features don't always line up in a way that's helpful for making and editing these specific diagrams. So the project idea is fix that, like pick some representation of quantum computations that you think is elegant, that you wish you could work with directly on a computer giving you feedback and then make it happen. All right, the third idea here is a bit vaguer, a bit more open-ended for sure. Uh, one of my pet peeves is that whenever I hear about a quantum game, it has a tendency to be a game uh, inspired by quantum mechanics instead of a game that actually uses quantum mechanics in the sense that like interference and entanglement are core elements to how you play the game. And if you remove those elements, the game just wouldn't be a, anything anymore. So I think there are a lot of possibilities here if you could just figure out how to make it work. Like the basic problem is it's extremely common in games to take actions that are irreversible, which if you want to make something quantum is a problem because irreversible actions are like measurements. They, they take away the quantumness. Even things as simple as Tetris are often built around these irreversible steps. Like you can't rewind Tetris and have the blocks fly apart in the correct order unless you're storing that order, unless you're effectively measuring it. So there's this really tricky obstacle here. It's not clear to me if it's you know, a fundamental unavoidable obstacle where it's just not possible to incorporate quantumness into most genres of games, or if it's just a conceptual obstacle where no one has thought of the right way to do it yet. So a really out there project idea is to, to try to do that, to try to make quantum Tetris that's really quantum without destroying the Tetrisness of it, or quantum Mario, or quantum something else that really seems like it wants to be classical. Uh, the fourth idea is a bit more in the weeds, so to speak. So as a field, quantum computing has all these ways of benchmarking how good a quantum computer is. There's randomized Clifford benchmarking and linear cross entropy benchmarking, quantum volume, all kinds of stuff. And almost all of it is way too complicated, by which I mean it's really difficult to explain the details of their definitions. 
know, in order to understand quantum volume, you have to understand heavy output generation. And that's a very specific technical thing and you need to know how it relates to fidelity. So I think something we could use is a bunch of dumb benchmarks that don't necessarily test the entirety of what it means to be a quantum computer, but are reasonably hard to do well on and incredibly simple to explain. So I have a few ideas here on the slide, like start with all the qubits off, turn one on, and then try to turn as many other ones on as you can using only controlled not operations. If your qubits decay to zero too quickly, it's really hard to turn on a lot of the qubits this way before the process dies out. So like the expected number of qubits you could turn on doing this is a benchmark. Or something that's true in quantum computing that's not true in classical computing is that every operation has a square root. For example, incrementing, like, like counting, has a square root. So you could implement a square root of increment operation on a quantum computer and see how well it does it. You know, how high can it count when it has to do two steps for every, every count? Uh, I would say there's like two sides to this generic project idea. One is to like come up with the dumb metrics, which is, I don't know, I find that fun. And the other one is to actually measure them on real quantum computers, which is like a different type of fun. Uh, the last idea that I wanted to share is a much more specific idea. Uh, so there are all these claims out there in the world about numbers being factored with quantum computers. And I kind of hate almost all of them because, wow, do people ever come up with clever ways to cheat at factoring, to do things that like look like they're working, but absolutely wouldn't work at scale. Anyways, uh, the, the technique of cheating at factoring was sort of perfected a decade ago when these researchers pointed out that if you knew the answer to the factoring problem, you could find this way to force Shor's algorithm into this trivial corner case where you just run this two qubit circuit. And anyone can just do this. Now, this was back in 2013, before there were publicly available quantum computers that anyone could use. So they didn't have a quantum computer to run this on. They, they just used a coin or something, I think, to as the stand-in. Um, but all of you have access to a quantum computer. You can just read this paper, follow the instructions, make a really, really big number to factor where you know the factors, and take the record for the biggest number pretended to be factored on a quantum computer. OK, that's, that's, that's it. That's all I had, had to share. Uh, this is supposed to be a short talk, and I'm glad I kind of cut it a little bit short because of the, the time issue at the start. Uh, I hope that this has been a little inspiring. And I really hope that people do some of these projects, uh, particularly the handheld qubits are something I wish existed. Uh, but that's my time. Uh, and I've left a little bit of time also at the end for questions. Like if you have questions about the project ideas or I don't know, about the Google quantum computing team, which was sort of maybe what they expected me to make this talk about, uh, I can answer those. Thank you so much for that talk, Craig. And the wonderful reminder that you know the hacking starts at MIT may have started at MIT iCloud for a lot of you, but it doesn't have to stop here. Um, we do have some questions here in the chat. Uh, and so I'll just go uh, one by one. So uh, the first question is, uh, first, first is a comment saying that I've used Quirk a lot for school and it's great. So <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, the second one is actually a question. So I consider myself to be, this is the um, question, I consider myself to be skilled in quantum computing, math, and coding all the back end logic. But I have no idea how to make these into an interactive front end like Quirk. Do you have any advice on where to start looking into front end development related to interactive quantum circuit building, quantum game building, um, program uh, building? Yeah, generally you would look like outside the field. So like people who make games do this kind of stuff all the time, like in fast interactive things. Um, I would recommend using JavaScript for it because it's so handy to be able to just give someone a, a link and they can open it in their browser. Whereas normally installing a program is, is more of an arduous affair. Although that being said, if you're going to go the like learn this via gaming route, then you probably use a tool like uh, Unity, which would, I don't think they have a JavaScript out, but they might. Um, yeah, I, I would. I wish I had more specific than just like look into making like small games, but like that'll definitely be sufficient. 
might not be necessary. Absolutely. Um, we we'll have to start somewhere. So uh, the next question is, what is the most quantum quantum game you've seen? As a... um, there's sort of like a vacuous way that puzzle games tend to be very quantum. Like it'll be a quantum circuit puzzle game. So it's going to be exactly quantum circuits. Uh, quantum chess is also pretty close because like there are actually moves you can make in quantum chess that take advantage of interference where you could imagine tricking someone where they think you're going to end up here, but actually that cancels out. Um, there are also games that are like uh, sort of like they have like a quantum wave function and you're like moving it and it, it kind of moves in a weird way. So it's hard for you to get it to where it's supposed to be. I think there's like a game called, I think that's called quantum moves. No, also pretty pretty quantum. Yeah, so there are definitely some out there. Um, but it's uh, that the idea was sort of about like fusing existing games with it, which I don't know how to do. Yeah, uh, the next question is, uh, uh, have you seen uh, quantum AI being used for neuroscience, or I guess broadly in uh, interesting applications at uh, different fields at uh, Google? Uh, in my opinion, no one has yet done anything useful with a quantum computer. So it would be more like, is the research interesting or is it promising at this point? Um, I, I'm not familiar enough with that to, to comment on it, unfortunately. But I, I, I guarantee you no one has done anything yet with a quantum computer that they couldn't have done with a simulation of a quantum computer with like the potential exception of totally random circuits, which are not useful but are at least difficult to simulate. And uh, uh, next uh, question is, how do undergrads get involved in the Google Quantum AI team? I, I missed the first half of what you were saying. Oh, yes. So, so the first half was, how can undergrads get involved in the Google Quantum AI team? Uh, probably the most accessible thing is to participate in the open source projects. So like all, all these big companies have open source projects. In Google's case, there's like Circ and QSIM. Uh, they're all on GitHub. Uh, if you follow this link, this link here on the screen, it'll take you there. Uh, or yeah, to GitHub slash quantum lib. Uh, yeah, that's that's the most approachable thing that you could do is to to join that. Uh, the Circ meetings, like the the organizational meetings where we, we like decide what to do, are all open access also. Like, I don't know where you go to find the link for it, but it's not. You can just join it as anyone. Yeah. So the next question is. Your, your voice isn't playing again. Hello. Can you can you hear me? I, I can hear you now. Okay. It seems like it's turning on your mic after like three seconds of you talking. Okay. That's a, that's a good good to know. Um, the next question is, uh, what are some applications and use cases maybe in the in the near term or in the future of practical quantum computers that excite you the most? Uh, I, I don't really have a great reason to believe this, but I think that they're going to end up being used as sensors and like interesting state producers a lot. Like there are particular things you might want to do in an optics experiment that can be it take like months of like screwing glass into the table and getting it all perfect that maybe if you had a quantum computer, you just reprogram it to do your different measurement. So it'd be much faster. Uh, the other big one is like chemistry simulation, where the quantum computer can act more like the way reality actually acts, and that allows it to be much more efficient with these chemistry simulations. Uh, and philosophically, although like I think factoring would be really cool philosophically, even though practically it's kind of got this disastrous impact for having to redo the cryptography on the internet. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see, we put in a number we don't know the factors to and it comes out and then you're like, you know for sure that it really, really works. Another question is, uh, are there any teams at Google AI who work on uh, quantum finance? Or- uh, I I don't know if there's anyone on the team who's worked on quantum finance things. There might have been some partnerships with banks and the researchers there might have worked on it. I, I'm not sure. Sorry, I, I don't know the answer to that question. 
Yeah. And I guess a related question maybe is, um, what about optimization type applications? Um, act Op optimization is this weird one where we really don't know if it's going to work. Like almost all of the optimization advantages that we know are quadratic advantages. And in order to really take advantage of them, you need error correction. But the overhead of the error correction is so big that it kind of kills the quadratic advantage until you get to problem sizes that are just ridiculous. So I think we either need to figure out better ways to do error correction, or we need to find specific optimization problems that have like exponential advantages instead of quadratic. It's it's definitely the like, someone just has to find something that works and there's so much that you could try that it, it's hard to say that there's nothing. Um, but I'm not aware of any like as worked out proposals as there are for chemistry, where chemistry we're confident that we can get like these huge advantages. Next question is how promising do you think topological quantum computing is? Um, and the same person also asked, do you think superconducting qubits will be uh, the dominant platform in the future? What was the first half of the question? The first half of the question was how promising do you think topological quantum computing is? Uh, if you're referring to Majorana based qubits, then I have no idea. Like that, that is still like an active field of research and no one has managed to, to make the thing yet. I, if you're referring to like the surface code, uh -huh. then I think it's one of the most promising routes. Like it's one of those promising error correcting codes. Mm -hmm. um, and the second, what was the second half of the question again? Yeah, the second half was, do you think, uh, do you think that oh, super yeah. like Qubit will be the dominant platform? I have no idea. Um, they have advan they, the advantages of superconducting qubits are there that they're very fast. So like compared to ion traps, they're two or three orders of magnitude faster. So if you manage to scale them, everything you do, you know, your clock time is a thousand times less. So instead of taking a year to do something, you can spend a day or half a day doing it. Um, ion traps have this advantage that they are like they're much more stable when they're not doing anything. Like their their qubits just want to sit there. And they're not going to be hit by cosmic rays or things like that, which we have to worry about. Um, photons, if they can like manage to make them couple right, they have this really cool thing where they can use delay lines. Like they use fiber optic lines to have a lot of photons going in a train as very cheap storage. Whereas with superconducting qubits, our storage and our compute are sort of the same level of expensive. So we don't have like a memory hierarchy like you do classically where your hard drive is less expensive than their CPU. Yeah, basically, I don't think anyone knows at this point what's going to end up working. All of them have these things that could be amazing about them. And it's probably going to come down to who can have not enough things that are terrible about them that decides it. Uh, so we're coming up and the end of uh, you're, you're still being muted for the first five seconds every time um i guess since we're coming up to the end of the time uh, maybe we can end with just one question uh i guess what are some of your top three um open source quantum projects that you would recommend people look into and contribute to oh i don't just want to list a bunch of google projects because those are the ones the most like i'm most familiar with those um Huh. I really like um, pi matching, which is an open source minimum weight perfect matcher for quantum error correcting codes. That uh, I don't know if it's a great one to recommend because like the algorithm is kind of technical. Um, probably the most accessible ones to people are the like general libraries like CERC and Qiskit and uh, Q Sharp and those types of things. But I, I'm sure that there are so many like fun little projects out there. Like uh, this, I don't know if you're still showing my slides, but uh, this is a screenshot from something called like Flyspec or like Quantum Game. And I think that's an open source project that you can contribute to. Great. So, uh, very cool. So thank you so much, um, Greg, for a fantastic talk and a lot of great uh, recommendations on what to do after MIT Um yeah, And now,